Can I ask you to find a, a seat? So, good evening, um, ladies and gentlemen. It's my very great pleasure to welcome you all to the inaugural lecture of Professor William Nottenbelt. You probably all know that inaugural lectures are one of the very few formal events which we have here at Imperial College. They provide a platform to showcase our new professors and the excellent research they do. More importantly, inaugural lectures are also an opportunity where we celebrate the, uh, the accomplishments of the individual and the fact that the individual is actually in our department. Tonight, we're delighted to celebrate the inauguration of Will, who has been Professor of Applied Quantitative Analysis since 2015. Will studied in South Africa. He graduated with a first class BSc in computer science from the University of Cape Town and stayed on there to do an MSc. In 1996, he came to Imperial College to our department and he studied for a PhD under the supervision of Pete Harrison, who I'm sure is somewhere here in the audience. Great. <laughs> um, his PhD was, uh, was addressing the challenges of constructing and solving very large continuous time Markov chains derived from dynamic specifications of com complex concurrent systems. Will's research agenda has been focused on developing stochastic modeling as well as quantitative data analysis techniques to no, uh, apply to a number of real world problems. It's a very broad topic and Will has studied a very wide range of applications including traditional computer systems, um, including uh, response times for disks, concurrency uh, for, for databases, parallel queuing systems, location tracking, and many applications outside computing including internet auctions, tennis matches, and even betting exchanges. <laughs> okay, so you might think betting exchanges is uh, esoteric. Um, however, when I looked into Will's research a bit more closely uh, in preparation for this inaugural, I realized that some of Will's highest impact work has been actually applied to studying the problems of car parking and penalty <laughs> charges for car parking related offenses. In particular, I was very pleasantly surprised to find some of Will's highest profile research being published in The Telegraph. I have the article from The Telegraph here uh, in, a, in, a, in, a news, in an article entitled Academic Finds Links Between Parking Tickets and Wardens Over Time. I can already see that there are not many fans of the, uh, of the Telegraph here. But uh, despite the nature of this publication, and you might think there's probably not very much quantitative modeling going on in this article. However, I want to really dispel this, uh, this myth by reading you a quote from the article. Dr. Nuttenbelt reached his conclusions by carrying out a detailed statistical analysis of the data provided by the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. He then crunched the numbers <laughs> using a recognized statistical tool known as Spearman's rank correlation. So it doesn't really get much more sophisticated in terms of data analysis than this. And you might, of course, say, well, an article in the Daily Telegraph, that's not really a peer-reviewed article. Uh, I have to disagree, because I realized that the Telegraph is one of these progressive publications which practices public peer review by including the reviewer's comments about the paper inside the paper. And to illustrate this, I want to read you one more quote from, the, from this article, which says, a spokesman for the NSL, the contractor used by the council, said that the research lacked any robust evidence. <laughs> Hang on. Which she found surprising given Dr. Nottenwell's stature. So I'm sure you, you can see that uh, you know, this is what we all suffer as, uh, as academic, unprovoked personal attacks from the reviewer uh, on the author of the research. But I just want to sort of uh, very briefly continue and say that Will, uh, Will has also done a lot of uh, other cutting edge research. And over the, over the years, uh, one of the defining features of Will's career in our department is that he is actually deeply cares about teaching. He has supervised in the last five years, I looked this up, more than 100 projects, 
student project, more than 50 group projects. Not only is this an unmatched re record by any academic in the department, but it's also fascinating to see the breadth of, uh, of these projects. Will has actually received number of outstanding con uh, aus uh, number of prizes for his outstanding contributions to teaching, including an engineering teaching award from the Royal Academy of Engineering and a President's Medal for outstanding contributions to teaching. Um, however, Will has also been instrumental in establishing the department's corporate uh, partnership program, which now has more than 40 different companies working with us as partners in research and teaching. And Will is a champion for entrepreneurship and serves ad as advisor to Entrepreneur First, which supports uh, engineers and computer scientists to become world class, uh, build world class tech, tech companies from scratch. He's also established the Center for Cryptocurrency Research and Engineering at Imperial. And under his leadership, the center is starting to exploit some of the uh, potential of blockchain technology and how this can fundamentally change the way how, um, in the way a society deals with contracts, identity, patents, copyrights, and even votes. And I'm sure Will will tell us more about this in his inaugural lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a very great pleasure to ask Will to give his inaugural lecture. Thank you, everybody. It's great to see so many of you here and to see so many old friends, colleagues, and uh, family. Um, this is going to be an outline of my talk, and don't be scared. <laughs> this is what we call a uh, Petri net, and it's one of my favorite modeling formalisms, and it can be readily mapped onto uh, uh, Markov chains. Right, so you'll see we will begin and end on this particular place here, so the circles of the places, and that you can think of them as either locations or resource holders, and this little uh, dot that you see here on the place, that's a token, so that indicates some kind of resource, and in this case, it's going to indicate how far we are through this particular uh, presentation. Right? Uh, the arrows uh, and the rectangles, they indicate the flow of the tokens, and the rectangles here, these are what's called transitions. They're the actions which are going to take place uh, during this particular uh, uh, presentation. Now, I've chosen this um, sort of representation not just because it's going to be an outline of the talk, but it's also kind of a metaphor for my progress through my own uh, research career. Right, so, mm, that's not good. <laughs> Technology, oh, there we go. Right, so, um, you, what you'll see here is this transition here is just lit up. That's because it's enabled because there's a token on the place leading into it. And when a transition is enabled, it can fire. It takes the token out of the uh, uh, places on the input and puts some tokens out on the output. Right? So we begin with a little look at the mark of chain. And here really is the hero of tonight. His name is Andrei Andreevich Markov, and he is a very famous, uh, deservedly so, uh, Russian uh, mathematician uh, who actually grew up in uh, St. Petersburg, and he went to the university there where he studied under Chebyshev. And by the time he was 30, he was a full professor. Um, now, he also liked to um, argue with his colleagues in a very forthright manner. And one of the things that he was arguing with his colleagues about um, was something called uh, the law of large numbers. And his colleagues said, this law only holds if the uh, quantities going into it are independent. And he said, no, I think I can come up with a case where uh, we will see this law holding uh, for a certain class of processes uh, which uh, are actually dependent quantities and dependent in a very uh, specific way. And you can see uh, the uh, paper here. Uh, don't worry, I can't make head or tail of it either. Um, <laughs> but what is important to note is that, whoops, um, do you see this little symbol here that occurs at the end of a lot of these words? This is, in Russian, what's called the hard sign. And in pre-revolutionary Russian, you will see this at the end of every word that ends in a hard uh, consonant. 
Right? So it was apparent that the pre-revolutionary Russians were rather obsessed about vowels and consonants, and we will see some more of that shortly. Right, so this obviously is no use to explain the Markov chain, so I'm going to try another way. Right? <laughs> the Markov chain is a curious beast. In fact, it is a combination of two curious beasts, the first being the frog, because it likes to jump around from state to state, and the other being the goldfish, because like the goldfish, the mark of chain has no memory, <laughs> right? It only knows about its current state, right? And its decisions about where to go to next are all based on where it is now. So this is the famous marker property, the property that the next state um, is, is, is some state y, given the history of the entire chain, is actually just the probability that the next state is y, given that we are currently in uh, one of the states. And uh, Markov actually applied this, he, he came up with this two-state uh, Markov chain for analyzing the poems of Pushkin. And um, if you, this is too technical for you, you might want to just read the poem, it's quite amusing. Uh, <laughs> But what we see here is we have a two-state Markov chain. We can be in the state vowel or consonant, and we can see that there is a tendency towards alternation because the figures on the arcs here are the probability of making a certain transition. So if the current letter is a vowel, you've got an 87% chance that the next letter is a consonant. And if you're looking at a consonant, you've got a 66% uh, chance that uh, the next letter is a vowel, right? And you've got the corresponding uh, probabilities of remaining in the vowel state or moving into the consonant state. And this is what we call a discrete time mark of chain. And obviously here, every uh, discrete step corresponds to advancing one letter in that particular uh, uh, poem. Uh, we can then go on to analyze this mathematically. So what we see here is a transition probability matrix. Uh, and you can see that there are two states here, just like here, this is the vowel uh, and this is the consonant state, and the probability of moving from the vowel to the consonant state is uh, 87% and, 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 and so on. So we encode these transitions in the diagram here in a simple matrix, which we can then analyze by performing what's called a steady state analysis. So we solve a set of equations and we come to the conclusion uh, that this process will spend roughly 43% of the time in the vowel state and 56% of the time in the consonant state, which happens to match very well the actual proportion of vowels and consonants in that particular uh, poem. Now, not all systems that we need to analyze actually work in this discrete time manner. Many systems work in real time in what we call continuous time. Uh, and in this case, we, don't, we can specify mark of chains, but we don't have probabilities. Uh, we use rates. So here we have a system where two computers are providing a service, and this is the state where both of them are working, and then you will see that they uh, break down at a total rate of two lambda, move to the state where one computer is working, it can break down, uh, and then there's a repairman who comes and tries to fix everything at rate uh, uh, mu. Right? This is like me at uh, a medical clinic called Doctor Today. Um, now, what we can do from this representation is come up with a matrix of transition rates, and we can solve a similar set of equations and work out the proportion of time uh, that we spend in each of those states. It turns out that the amount of time that we spend in each of these states follows a particular distribution called the exponential distribution, which is in fact what we call a memoryless uh, uh, distribution. So the idea of this is, here you can see uh, an exponential distribution with rate parameter two. So there's some kind of event that's trying to happen on average twice a second. And this gives you an idea of how lightly it's to, uh, uh, to occur as time uh, moves forward. Now, if we have happened to have waited um, 0.8 seconds and nothing has happened, right? if we consider the, the density of the remaining time, uh, we move that back to the origin and then we renormalize it. Well, it's exactly the same as the original um, uh, density. So in other words, it doesn't matter how long uh, we have waited. Uh, we still don't know how long we will have to wait in the future. It is, in fact, a completely memoryless uh, distribution. Now, 
Markov faced a little bit of prejudice with regard to what he tried to do with respect to numerical computation. Right? Many mathematicians apparently believed that going beyond the field of abstract reasoning into the sphere of affected calculations would be humiliating. <laughs> right? uh, fortunately, we seem to have left that era long behind us. And in fact, with computers being what they are, there is a, a real realization that in order to be able to deal with today's uh, uh, systems and models and model them effectively, we need to be able to generate and solve extremely large mark of chains. And this is kind of what I spent the early part of my career uh, focused on. Right? Challenges like how to deal with the state space explosion if you get a complicated system with lots of interacting uh, uh, a agents that can generate a very large uh, state space. How do you specify these Markov chains elegantly? And typically, you wouldn't specify the Markov chain directly. You would use a formulism like a queuing network, like a Petrinet, or perhaps a stochastic process algebra. Right? And you need mechanisms for going from those formalisms onto Markov chains. And you have to do all of that in the context of very limited uh, memory and uh, CPU power. So fortunately for me, just as I started uh, work on this, a professor in the department, John Darlington, secured a fantastic parallel computer called the AP3000, which I'm sad to say is now a museum piece, literally. Uh, but it enabled me then to uh, tackle with gusto this uh, problem of uh, the very large uh, state spaces. And there were three key ingredients that we used to tackle this problem. The first was the idea of using probabilistic data structures. So with a probabilistic algorithm, you give up the requirement that the uh, computation always produces the correct answer. It may be good enough that the computation produces the correct answer, say, 99.9% .9 of the time. Uh, and if you can do that with using a lot less memory and a lot less CPU, then that's a good thing. So that's one approach that we did. And we basically discovered that our approaches there were based on a data structure invented in the 70s by a guy called Bloom, the Bloom filter. Uh, it's a great thing to look up if you want to uh, look, after, uh, uh, look it up afterwards. So I mentioned the parallel machine. It's also uh, fantastic if you can explore these state spaces and solve the corresponding equations uh, in parallel. And the other thing that you can do is to make use of the fact that not all of this computation uh, needs to take place uh, in main memory. And not all of the huge transition matrices and so on need to be in memory at the same time. So you can use something called an out-of-core algorithm um, to, to help you there. So this is some of our early work in, in that direction. Basically moving the state of the art from about 100,000 states to about 100 million states in about five years. So this was kind of towards the end of the 1990s. And I'm very sorry to say that the state of the art is still languishing around there, despite the way uh, actually the hardware and so on has, has, has greatly improved. So any students looking for good, good projects, <laughs> you know, can, can, can we make this 100 billion, yeah? So that was the, that, that was the mark of chain. Uh, now we have what's called a conflict situation because you can see that this marking here enables two uh, transitions. Uh, what we do here when we have the situation is we have to look at the firing rates of these transitions, right? This one goes four times per time unit. This one goes two times per time unit. And you can see there's a slight tension here between discussing response time analysis and going to some sort of surprise. So. Um, <laughs> What, what we're going to do is to resolve this conflict is that we need some sort of probability, some, some sort of probabilistic mechanism that four times out of six is going to go this way and two times out of six is going to go that way, right? So we can just roll a dice, <laughs> handily enough. And if it comes up uh, one to four, we're going to go this way. And if it comes up with five or six, we're going to go that way, yeah? And, oh, it's a three. <laughs> That's, that's a very good example of pseudo-random number generation. <laughs> so we're going to go here to the response time analysis. So um, what, what, what you realize when you do a steady state analysis is that you're doing an analysis that's from the system's point of view, 
um, and, and doesn't really help you understand how customers are being treated within the system. Right? And yet we really do care about how customers get treated in systems. Right? So in accident emergency units, they have a target that 95% of the patients need to be discharged or admitted within four hours of arrival. And my poor dad who works in an A&E is intimately acquainted with that target. Um, the uh, Royal Mail aspires to deliver 23% uh, of first class letters the next working day. <laughs> Compare the urgency. The Research Council will notify 90% 90%, and I'm always in the 10% of proposers of the outcome of the proposals within 26 weeks of receipt. Anyway, what you can see here is that it's very important to be able to reason about response time distributions and percentiles, right? Now, most analysis is based around calculating expected values and means, which is actually no good when it comes to this sort of analysis. So, what we realize, though, is that there's a very straightforward way of going from a set of equations which looks a little bit like the steady state equations into a set of equations which can help you reason about the response time. And in order to do that, you have to get out of the time domain, the usual uh, world we live in, and move into the frequency domain um, and exploit the properties of a very nice uh, a transform called the uh, Laplace transform. Now, when you move into the Laplace transform world, things are very spooky, right? If you want to differentiate something, you just multiply it by this, uh, its, its parameter s, right? If you want to integrate it, you divide by the parameter. If you want to convolve two distributions together, well, then you just multiply them together. It's a, it's a fantastic world to, to be in for the modeler, right? So, what we what we say here is that the Laplace transform of the response time distribution from some initial state i into a set of target states uh, j is given by, well, we have to add two things together. We have to look at all the successor states of, uh, of, of, of uh, um, i and say, if we're not moving into one of the target states, we need to convolve the amount of time we'll be in state i uh, with the time it's going to take me to get from state k into one of the target states. And if I am going into one of the target states, well, then it's just the amount of time that I will be in uh, state i. And really, what this gives you is just a set of linear equations to solve. Of course, if you actually want to get a, a proper uh, uh, density or distribution out of this, well, then you need to be able, prepared to invert these quantities. And that involves a procedure called numerical Laplace transform inversion, which involves evaluating equations like these at many different uh, values of uh, S here. So this was one of the first papers I did uh, after my uh, PhD, appeared at ACM uh, uh, Sigmetrics. And essentially what we've done here is come up with a MapReduce pipeline for inverting response time distributions using the uh, technique that I've just shown you. So you put in your high-level formalism here, it generates the state space and the transition matrix, it inverts the corresponding equations, and then produces a nice plot of the corresponding density or distribution from which you can work out all of your target uh, percentiles and, and, and so on. And this was also the basis of our first research grant, which is passage times in large Markov and semi-Markov chains, handily abbreviated to pastrami. <laughs> now, one of the reviewers, and there is always a jealous reviewer, <laughs> even when you write an article about parking, um, said, I really don't like this grant because it's named after a foodstuff. <laughs> anyway. Um, we then, we then went on, my first PhD student, Nick Dingle, um, uh, went on to think about how to apply this to many other different formalisms, including uh, generalized stochastic uh, uh, Petri nets. Um, and he did his PhD on this uh, uh, topic. Um, we also went on uh, with my very good friend, uh, Jeremy uh, Bradley, who's here uh, tonight, and, and his wife, Helen. We came up. Uh, with a method of solving these equations in parallel, but using many different groups of processes to solve each set of Laplace transform equations in a way that minimized the amount of communication uh, that was necessary between the processes doing that computation. 
And uh, if you want to know more about that, there was another PhD student, uh, Alexander Trufinovich, who's also here, um, who came up with the world's first uh, parallel tool for s solving, uh, for, or sorry, for partitioning uh, very large hypergraphs. So this is a tool that can help you efficiently partition circuits uh, to lay out distributed databases in an efficient manner uh, and so on. It's really worth uh, a read. Um, right, so that was uh, learning about how to set up all the theory behind uh, response time analysis, but what about some of the uh, applications? So one of the first things that we looked at was the common hard disk, right, which is still the capacity backbone of uh, uh, the data uh, center. Now these hard disks, they are absolutely amazing things, right? This platter is spinning at speeds of up to 120 miles per hour. The head is hovering over the surface of this platter at a distance that is less than the wavelength of light, right? And if it touches that platter, it's a disaster and yet somehow they managed to keep them apart, right? Uh, these tracks that it's reading from, they're not perfectly round, and they are one three hundredths the thickness of a piece of paper, right? Um, they've also, just by their geometry, you can see there's something very interesting going on. The outside of the disk is moving a rather a lot faster than the inside of the disk. And so you can store more data around the outside and retrieve it much faster than the data from the inside of the disk. So these disks actually uh, are what they call zone disks. And so we took on the, the interesting idea of trying uh, to develop a, a Markovian model for representing the functioning of one of these disks when they have a, uh, a, 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 a Markovian workload. And uh, there are three parts to that. You've got to work out the seek time, how long is it going to take this head to get to the right track. You've got to work out the rotation time, which is like how long do you wait for the data to come around. And then you have to work out the transfer time. I'm just going to show you a little bit about the transfer time, uh, just to give you an idea how, of how fiddly this particular computation is. Right? So um, here you can see because of the zoning, Right? The transfer time is a very complicated function of not just the sectors per block and the rotation time, uh, but all sorts of other uh, parameters to do with uh, the, the, the geometry of the disk. Right? So not only did we have to work out what all of those distributions looked like, we then had this incredibly difficult uh, task of trying to work out how to parameterize actual disks to see if this model was accurate. Right? And uh, Francis Wan, who's down here uh, today, he, he was the project student that worked on this together with uh, Nick and Abigail, who did her PhD in this area, um, and, and, and did great work in actually extracting these parameters, uh, which the manufacturer wasn't too keen on uh, disclosing, actually. And what we did realize as we did this is actually there's rather a nice way of going about modeling that can bring you some extra insights if you've got uh, lots of resources and time to do three different kinds of modeling, right? The one way is to do analytical modeling, to try come up with an efficient model with closed form expressions for your metrics that you can very easily use to evaluate a huge range of different alternatives when it comes to the parameters, right? Um, the other way of doing things is to come up with your own simulation of what's going on, maybe a discrete event simulator uh, of the type that my colleague Tony Field is absolutely brilliant at producing, right? And maybe also it's a good idea to take an actual system and measure it, right? And this is the ultimate ground truth. We had many arguments of people coming to my office saying, I'm sorry, the benchmark is wrong. It doesn't agree with the model. <laughs> And I had to say, I'm sorry, reality is not agreeing with the model. We have to think again. Um, and what's very interesting then is if you uh, are able to take those three completely different approaches and get them to mutually validate each other and agree, like it's doing here for a particular uh, measurement of response time uh, on a disk, then you know that you've got a model that's working really well and in this case is not just giving you like average access times or whatever, it's actually giving you the full distribution of the time so you can tell 80% of these accesses are going to happen in under 24 uh, milliseconds. And this was the basis of Abigail's 
um, um, PhD. So Abigail uh, was uh, one of my first PhD students, and she is now chief data scientist at USwitch. And we had two uh, research grants as well that uh, emerged from this uh, work that were incredibly great fun to uh, work on. Of course, the single disk isn't the end of the uh, uh, story. Uh, in data centers, you find these things called RAID arrays, redundant arrays of inexpensive disks. And the idea is um, to use multiple disks to enhance both the performance, because you can stripe the data across the disks, and reliability, because you can add redundancy, which enables you to recover in the case of a, uh, a, a failed disk. So what you have here is a logical I.O. request comes in. It gets chopped up amongst all of these physical disks. And when they've all completed, uh, you can move on to the next logical I.O. request. So this is called split merge or fork join behavior. And it comes with a whole lot of new modeling challenges, right? So, um, and this was the start of our interest in this uh, whole uh, uh, notion of parallel queuing systems of this notion of systems where uh, tasks come in, they split into subtasks, and then they somehow uh, rejoin. And uh, Irina uh, Shimashenko, for example, did her PhD in that area, and Tommy Pesu is carrying on um, that work. Uh, this is just an example of the kind of uh, result that we were then able to get. So here we are comparing the observed uh, density of uh, response time in a particular kind of RAID array for a particular kind of uh, write request. Uh, that's the, uh, the measurements of that black, this black histogram there. And then we've got three different kinds of uh, Markovia model that we've overlaid over that, which give a pretty good match um, to, to the shape. Uh, other work that we did, well, um, we had a look at patient flow in accident and emergency units. Basically, follow my dad around with a clipboard. <laughs> Not really. Uh, um, this was a student of mine called uh, Susanna Ao Jung, did some amazing work and a lot of in-depth uh, research into the processes uh, that all the different patients in the A&E department uh, uh, went, went through when they came into the unit and made a lovely queuing model of this that showed that prioritizing patients with minor injuries and minor illnesses is exactly the right thing to do. It's beneficial both for other patients with minor illnesses and injury and patients with major illnesses and injury because it keeps the system much more clear and it keeps resources available to deal with uh, emergencies. And Susanna wrote that up in her uh, PhD uh, thesis. Uh, two more uh, PhD students of mine, Nicholas Anastasiu and Su Ching Hornge, did some uh, work on going from location tracking data to performance models. So our idea was, could you, for example, walk into the accident emergency unit, put location tracking tags on uh, the staff and, say, the medical records, let them go about their business, and then come up with a performance model that explained why all the patients were waiting around for so long. Um, and, and so both Nicholas and Su Ching did amazing work uh, in, the, in their PhDs uh, to, to work out exactly uh, how to do that. It, it's a beautiful thing to see um, this raw location tracking data suddenly emerge as a, um, uh, uh, like a, a, a Petri net or, or queuing network out the other end. So that was the um, uh, work on... Uh, the disk arrays, and you can see that our token has split across the three disks there and is about to rejoin. Um, I want to talk now about um, another hobby of mine, as you've heard, is, which is tennis modeling. And you can see here we have this transition here. It's called the serve. So we are going to observe the serve of John Isner, who uh, serves at 150 uh, miles uh, per hour. And you can see how, what an incredible action uh, that is. Now, why tennis, right? Um, and what makes it suitable for modeling? Well, tennis is actually a lovely sport because there's only two people who usually play it, right? And there's, there's a doubles match on. But uh, for, for, for the professional singles matches, there's just two players on the court. There's no interaction between team members. There's one person on each team, and that's it, right? Uh, there are usually only two um, 
match outcomes, although um, I hope this works. There are other unusual match outcomes, so like this one. <laughs> yeah? So this is David Nalbandian drawing blood from a line judge. Yeah? And getting himself disqualified. Now, unfortunately, that is something that we absolutely cannot include in any model. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, it was a revelation to me that it's not just two outcomes. A can retire, B can retire, A can assault the line judge, B can assault the line judge. <laughs> right. Um, also, in, in, in tennis, the, it turns out that there is no significant home advantage. Um, you know, in football, there's a very strong home advantage for the team that, that, that's playing at home, not so in uh, tennis. There's also lots of uh, historical data about this, and it has been recognized since the 1960s, although nobody told me until much later, uh, that tennis is actually a mark of chain, right? So this is one of the classic textbooks on mark of chain. It's called Kemeny and Snell from 1960, and they actually have this tennis example in it. Now, how does it work? The state is the score, Right? So you start off at love, love, and you move to, if the um, server wins the point, you move to the uh, state 15, love. And the only probability you need to know in looking at a game is the probability with which the server is going to win the point. Okay? And you can see here that we've assumed that the probability that uh, uh, the server wins the point is the same for all points. We've done subsequent work to show that's not true, that there are people who either get nervous or uh, actually relish those critical uh, break points and so on, and it, it makes a big, um, it can make a big difference to these probabilities. But a simple model will assume that all these probabilities are the same. And of course, uh, one minus the probability of the server winning the point gives the probability that the receiver wins the point. And we either end up in the state where the servers won the game or where the receivers um, won the game. And really, it's this uh, absorption probability that then gives us the uh, probability of winning the, uh, the, the whole game. So if you take this and you solve for the probability of absorption from starting in the love-love state to the uh, state where P1 uh, wins, and the probability of P1 winning a point is P, then you get this equation here. So you can see that if you can win, uh, about 75% of your uh, points on your serve, you will crush this game. You will do very well, right? And this is part of the reason why someone like John Isner does very well, because he's got a cracking big serve that nobody can return, right? So he's up in this region, and the probability of him winning games in his serve is uh, very high. Um, of course, the individual game is not the end of it when it comes to tennis. There's a set where the serve alternates, and you need to take that uh, into account. But again, this is just a mark of chain, where now the probabilities are just the probability of you winning a game. Right? So we take the output of the results from that first uh, game level analysis, and we put it into uh, the set level analysis. And of course, we can take the output of the set level analysis and put it into this uh, match level analysis. So this here, in particular, is the a best of three sets match. So we start with um, uh, nil-nil in terms of the sets, then we end up with uh, one player or the other winning. So we can also use these hierarchical models to work out the probability of either of the players uh, winning the match from any particular point that happens to uh, arise while the match is in play. So here we have a situation where they've won one set all, it's four games to one to player one, and it's currently love-love uh, in the game. Now, obviously the key to getting those models right is to estimate those probabilities with which each player is going to win the point on their serve accurately. And um, so we came up with something called uh, the impact model. And I'm very pleased to say that one of the developers of the impact model, Brian e. Goldsack, is sitting here uh, today. And uh, the idea of this model is that 
you cannot characterize the strength of a tennis player in terms of one metric, right? When you look at the tennis rankings and you see that this person is number one and this person is number two and this person number three, that's nonsense because there are two important elements of a tennis game, the serve and the return. And your ability in both of those is absolutely paramount and cannot be summarized in one number, right? So, um, we came up with this model that actually characterizes what effect do I have on my opponent's serve on average and what effect do I have on their return uh, on average. And what we see are uh, uh, sort of scatter plots like this. So this is the serve impact. This is how I will affect the serve of my opponent because my return is good. And this is the return impact, which is how will I affect uh, the uh, uh, return of my opponent because my serve is so good. So do you see up here there's some players, John Isner, our great big whacking serve guy, who turns out actually to benefit the serve of his opponents because his return is really weak, right? But he will strip off 12 uh, percentage points of your normal return because his serve is so fierce, right? So these guys here are what we call the big servers and they are one way to be successful in men's tennis. Right, have a cracking great big serve and which nobody can return and then doesn't matter if you're not that good at um, returning their serve, you just have to wait to get lucky. <laughs> and that's why when these guys play matches, they're very, very long, right? And they all come down to tie breaks and, 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 and so on and so forth. And you remember John Isner and Mahut played the longest match in history at uh, uh, Wimbledon because in Wimbledon there's no tiebreaker in the final set. Um, you also observe that all the really good champions are down here on the edges of these graphs. We've got Federer here, Djokovic, uh, Andy Murray, right? And it's almost like being on this sort of efficient frontier here is a, a key to actually being a champion and, and, uh, and, and winning at uh, tennis. Uh, if we have a look at the women's game, you will notice that there are no big servers in women's tennis, at least no big servers who can't return. There is a big server, her name is Serena Williams, but she also returns like a demon, <laughs> right? And, and she stands out here alone and peerless amongst uh, 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 the women players. Uh, other players like uh, Radvanska, Sharapova, Halep, and, and Azarenka, uh, they are again the champions here on the uh, sort of uh, edge of this graph. People like Caroline Wozniacki, excellent players, but possibly doomed to not win that many Grand Slams and so on because they're actually inside this uh, efficient frontier. And if you plot what's going on then, if you take that sort of kind of scatter plot summary and, and, and put it into this box plot form, well, what you can see is that here are those big servers, right? Uh, Raonic and Isner and Karlovic, right? With their absolutely weedy returns. Right? And here are the champions. These are the Federers and the uh, 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 Djokovic and Murray and so on are in this region where they take strips off both of their, um, uh, the, the return and the serve of their uh, opponents. Right? And then there's the, the rest of the field. In the women's game, uh, we see it's a little bit more uh, regularly uh, layered, right? There's the champions group down here with people like Serena Williams and Agnieszka Rovanska and Sharapova in it, and then um, it's a little bit more uh, balanced. So, how does the impact model work? Well, what the impact model is able to do is to take a match that's coming up, look at the relative impacts uh, that uh, these uh, players have had on their opponents in the recent past and then come up with a confidence interval prediction for what the percentage of points won on the serve will be and what the percentage points won on the return will be, right? So here we see this was a, a, a match that I discussed in great detail with Bryony uh, uh, ahead of it because I said uh, this model is bonkers. It is predicting that Aru Barina is going to win this match and we all know that Sabine Lasiki is top 20. Um, and uh, that she's 65% favorite to win on the, on the betting markets, right? And we had a long exchange about check it, check it again, and it, the, it was right. This is what it said, and you can see it's actually predicting on a clay court, uh, a Rubirina will win more uh, points than 
Lesiki. The actual match result was this, that Aruburina did beat Lesiki, and uh, there are the actual match stats. That's for Aruburina's stats, and that's Sabine uh, Lesiki's stats very nicely inside those confidence interval uh, uh, boxes. So that's just an illustration of the kind of thing that gets uh, us excited in, in, in tennis modeling. Um, we now have the forehand uh, uh, transition, and you can see here Flavia Panetta showing us how to hit the open stance forehand. Uh, my uh, PhD student, uh, Sylvia uh, Vineyes, is actually looking at tennis videos and working on how to identify all the subtle variations of shots that there are out there, like the slice serve and um, uh, the two-handed backhand and, and, and so on. And the lucky fish is off to Honolulu, Hawaii, <laughs> to go and um, present uh, this uh, shortly. This used to be the way we used to pick conferences to submit to. We used to say, where are they and, you know, what are they and where are they and where would we like to go and then work out where to, to submit our papers. Um, all right, we have the backhand and this is one of my favorite players, Stan Varinka. Um, not only is backhand very good, but he has a rather inspirational quote written on his arm, <laughs> which I like very much, try to live by. And now we've come to that point in the presentation where the ball has hit the net court. And if you remember the movie Match Point and how it opens, yeah, people are afraid to face how great a part of life is dependent on luck. It is very true. And there are moments in every inaugural lecture where the ball hits the top of the net, <laughs> and for a split second it can go forward or back. Right? So would you like to see it go towards the surprise, <laughs> or would you like to see it go towards digital money? Surprise, surprise. excellent. If, it was going, if you said digital money, I was going to say, well, surprise, it's going to be the surprise. <laughs> uh, so for the surprise, I would like to invite our uh, MSc group project students up. And this particular surprise, I call uh, the MSc students versus the Markov chains. <laughs>
Thank you very much, guys. And I think we can agree that the MSc students were rather better than the Markov chain, yeah? <laughs> uh, I think that's a great example of not only the fantastic ability of uh, uh, our students, but just how lucky uh, we are as academics to, to work here and work with these wonderful people. Um, it's also a good example of a kind of project I like to do just for fun. Um, right, so moving on from the surprise then, let's see where this uh, transition is headed. Oh, look, it's digital money. Um, so, let's just talk a little bit about digital money or cryptocurrency and, and, and what it's all about. So I've called it here the value token revolution, right? Uh, so essentially what we've uh, uh, got here is a digital analog of something that we're already very familiar with, right? So the uh, notes that you have in your pocket, they are centrally produced and managed. They're very physical, right? You can pass them around, give them to each other. Um, it's very interesting because people seem to feel that these notes are valuable because they're backed by something. But I'm not sure if you've read the promise on them, right? I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of 20 pounds. Well, that's what I already have. <laughs> and if the pound is not worth anything, then I have something worth nothing. Right? Just something to think about. When people say, why do bitcoins, why, why do other cryptocurrencies have value? The answer is because people believe that they do. Um, and it's just like, just like the, the pound, right? Uh, the security inherent in, in the money in your pocket is all down to some sort of a complex production process that's designed to make it difficult to, to duplicate, right? The shiny strip here, the watermark, and, 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 and so on and so forth. When it comes to new forms of digital money, and here I'm thinking about things like Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum, and, and Monero, uh, these are decentralized systems. They've got no central points of control. There's no central bank uh, deciding how many notes to print or whatever. This is all done in, in, in software. It's digital, which means you can teleport it around the world instantly. Okay? And it's backed by a guaranteed scarcity of supply. So we know that, for example, there will only ever be 21 million bitcoins. Could you say the same thing about the pound note or the euro or the US dollar? Right? And we know that it is also secured by a vast network of computational power, and I'll explain how that works in a second, uh, and also by public key cryptography. Unless somebody has your private key, they can't spend your money. Right? Unless they get hold uh, of the secret information, they cannot take your cryptocurrency away from you. This is not advocating anyone to go and invest in this stuff. It is horrendously volatile. Um, so you can see that transition has just fired, and uh, we now have tokens appearing on these three places here. And you see there's a number three on that particular uh, uh, arc there, which means three tokens have come into Ethereum here. This means I'm mostly going to talk about Ethereum rather than the other two. So Bitcoin was the original um, um, cryptocurrency. It's very good at moving Bitcoins around from A to B. Uh, Ethereum is a bit more sophisticated. It's kind of a global distributed computer. It also moves a token of value around called Ether, uh, but it can wrap that movement of value in what's called a smart contract. So there can be like, it's like programmable money, if you, if you will. Uh, Monero is ultra private money. Um, it's uh, very, very hard to trace thanks to its use of a technology called uh, ring signatures. So yeah, that's, that's Bitcoin, that's Ether, and that's Monero. Uh, all of these uh, cryptocurrencies store their transactions in something called uh, a, a blockchain. So what's a blockchain? A blockchain is just a record of all of the transactions that have taken uh, place. Right? It's a bit like a linked list, uh, except that uh, there is this guarantee of integrity between uh, the blocks. Yeah? The current block stores the fingerprint or hash of the previous block in it, which means to say if I change anything in the previous block, if I try to edit history, I'm not going to get away with it. Everybody will know that I was trying to commit fraud, right? And if you have a look at what the transactions inside a block are, well, they are just the... 
uh, the movements of the token of value that you would expect to see. So this is the Bitcoin blockchain. So Alice is paying Bob three Bitcoins and so on and so forth. Uh, but there's no one in control of this system, right? There's no central node, no central bank of Bitcoin. So what happens is this, this big lottery that goes on in the background, and your chances of winning this lottery are roughly proportional to the amount of computational power you have. Um, and when you win this uh, lottery, you get the right to publish a new block, including for yourself a nice reward, right? That's the incentive for you to take part in this lottery. Um, and uh, if it were not for this reward, then nobody would take part. Well, maybe some people for academic interest would take part in the lottery, but it would be very insecure and easily knocked over, right? Uh, there are also transaction fees for including these transactions in the block, which uh, is an incentive to um, the people taking part in this uh, lottery to actually process them. So, this lottery is called something called proof of work, which you may uh, have heard of. The participants in the lottery are termed miners. So, just like traditional miners are trying to dig um, gold uh, out of the ground, so these miners are trying to find uh, bitcoins and ether uh, and so on by spending some uh, electricity. The entries into this lottery are termed hashes. So every time you, you try and, and, and win the right to publish a block, uh, that uh, costs you some uh, effort, right? And the winner of this lottery wins the right to publish a block of transactions, which includes that reward for saying, oh, you found the block, well done, you get a reward, and also the transaction fees of all the transactions that go in there. Now, the beautiful thing about cryptocurrency is that the difficulty of this lottery is regulated. The more people get greedy and buy expensive equipment and try and uh, enter this lottery, the more difficult it becomes. Right? And that's brilliant because the supply of the cryptocurrency then is very well regulated. If they didn't do that, then suddenly as people got better hardware and faster computers and more graphics cards and so on, then you, we would issue this money faster and faster. But the system says no, no matter how greedy people get, I'm going to carry on issuing uh, the currency at the same rate. Now notice, what is the connection to uh, mark of change, the coin connection? Uh, well, a lottery is a memoryless thing. If I buy a hundred tickets for this Wednesday's lottery, uh, and then I um, uh, don't win, well, I'm sorry, it doesn't help me on the Saturday's lottery, does it? Yeah, not unless I win lots of lucky dips. But um, uh, the, the point is that this is actually a memoryless process. And if you have a look, right, and here's one of our students who's set up uh, an Ethereum mining rig in his. Uh, uh, dorm room, had to, <laughs> had to turn it off because it got too hot. Can't recommend this sort of thing, fire hazard and all that. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, these, um, these graphics cards here are making millions of entries every second into the Ethereum um, uh, 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 lottery. But if you have a look at the resulting block times, at the resulting intervals, but, uh, between which people actually win this lottery, it turns out to follow the exponential distribution, right? Because it is a, a, a memoryless um, uh, activity, which means we can bring all of our mark of modeling and so on to bear on this kind of uh, uh, chain. Whew. We were very happy when we discovered that. <laughs> so. The thing is that if you're going to enter this lottery by yourself, you're probably not going to do very well. You're probably going to discover a block very irregularly, and, and you're not going to discover that many blocks. So what you can do is tr club together with some friends, make a mining pool, uh, whereby the rewards from all of your joint efforts then get somehow distributed to everybody on some kind of equitable basis, right? And one way in which this is done is that we form a queue of participants ordered by contribution, and when the pool wins a reward, we give it to the participant at the head of the queue, right? So I'm about to suggest a new revolutionary way for reorganizing the payment of salaries in the department. <laughs> what we should do is put all our staff members out there, and every time they do some work, we give them some credits, right? You supervise a project, you, 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 know, you get a new PhD student, you, you get some research grants or whatever, you get some more credits. Okay. We take all the money we normally pay for salaries and we put it into a pot that drops from the sky 
at exponential intervals, but such that the total amount that drops will drop from the sky during the year is equivalent to the amount being paid at the moment for salaries. Okay, so here we have this uh, thousand pound pot waiting to drop at an exponentially distributed random moment onto the head of the person who happens to have done the most work in the department at that <laughs> moment, right? So this guy here who's done 50 credits worth of work, or this person here who's done 50 credits worth of work, gets this thousand pounds dropped on their head, right? Now you see then that their credits then need to be adjusted. And it turns out the fairest adjustment of the credits is not to reset these credits to zero, but to reset these credits to how many credits they've done less the amount of, um, you know, it's all, all to do with the relative amount of work that you're doing. So the amount of credits that this um, person will then get having received their little salary payment will go to 10 uh, credits. That person then has to go back into the queue wherever they should uh, stand. And notice it's not necessarily the back of the queue. If, 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 if that difference, uh, if they were doing such a lot of work that, that they, they, they shouldn't actually go to the back of the queue, then they will come in there. And then we wait for the next thousand pounds to drop onto the head of the person who's done the, uh, the most work. Now, you might think that sounds absolutely ludicrous, right? And it probably is for a salary payment scheme, but it's exactly what's going on in queue-based Ethereum mining pools out there, right? Here is the queue of people. Here is the amount of work that uh, they've done in terms of what's called the credits here. And you'll see the person who's done the most work here with the 867 tera hashes, that's 867 trillion hashes, right, is actually waiting for the next block. Uh, to be won by the mining pool, and they will pick up all of the block reward uh, when that happens, less a little fee for the, for, for the mining pool, right? And then their credits will get reset to the difference between themselves and the person after it. So who thinks that sounds like a good idea? Yeah? Who thinks this is great for people who do a lot of work? <laughs> yeah? Who thinks this is not good for people who do a lot of work? Yeah, people are a little bit unsure. So what we've done is we've simulated this particular um, um, setup, and it turns out that this is actually bad for people who do a lot of work. If you look at the relative difference in return uh, in terms of the number of mega hashes that you're doing by your hash rate, so here, here, are the, uh, here are the very busy miners doing a lot of work. They are actually getting, relatively speaking, to uh, the, the, the slow miners who are not doing a lot of work, they are actually getting a bit of a poorer reward. There's about a 4% difference between uh, the reward that they're getting for their work versus the people with the, uh, uh, the, the slower uh, hash rate. And that was kind of a surprise because if you look in the um, uh, discussion forums and so on, you get conflicting advice about if you're a big miner, whether or not to join this pool. In fact, they say, if you're a big miner, you should come along and join this pool. And of course, all these people are very happy when you do. <laughs> you know, so, you know, it's like when you read in, in one of those troll boxes on a cryptocurrency exchange, buy this, buy this, you know, that means, oh, I have to get rid of a lot of this, I, you know, you need to sell. Um, now, what's also interesting is if you then have a look at um, the reward uh, so for um, this kind of queue-based system versus a more traditional uh, system that just uh, disperses reward proportionally to the contribution uh, made in a particular round, then you can see actually this is quite um, uh, inequitable um, compared to that other, compared to a more flatter system where you just dish out rewards proportional to the contribution, which is the other way to do things. Um, and it all boils down to the fact that who do you not want to be in this picture? Guy. This guy, exactly. Thank you, Sophia. Yes, you do not want to be this guy because he's doing all the hard work and all the others are riding on uh, his, 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 his efforts. And if you want to learn more about this, then uh, we have a paper coming up at the uh, mascots conference. Um, and this will shortly be available once we once we finish preparing the uh, camera ready copy. There's girls swimming with fishes and sharks beneath the surface of Q-based Ethereum mining pools. I think it took longer to come up with the title than to write the paper. <laughs> um, so I'd just like to conclude then with some um, words of thanks. 
So firstly, to my beautiful wife and my lovely daughter, Monica and Ella. Um, honestly, you guys, you're amazing support to me. Thank you um, very much. Uh, you, oh, they also put up with uh, what we call the beast <laughs> heating up the living room. So this chews 450 watts of power. It mines Ethereum, and it's got two RX uh, 480 graphics cards in there that do that all, all day and create a lot of heat and noise and so on. Um, Right next to the beast, we have Ella's mini beast. This is a Raspberry Pi that uses four watts of electricity. And it runs a uh, particular cryptocurrency for, called Peercoin because it uses a particular system. It's not proof of work, it's proof of stake, so, uh, which is much more energy efficient, as you can see. Um, of course, Ella doesn't use it for the Peercoin. She likes to do scratch programming. Um, also to my uh, mum and dad who are here tonight, thank you very much, uh, guys, for always uh, supporting me and for showing me uh, the value of an education and always believing in that uh, uh, very strongly. Also, to all the funders of uh, my research, from the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, uh, to Innovate UK, to uh, more latterly uh, uh, blockchain and, and, and outlier ventures, all of the support is absolutely essential. And, uh, you know, and since the country has no money left, we are increasingly, <laughs> we are increasingly dependent on the goodwill of, 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 of industry to uh, uh, make pro progress. Uh, also, to all of the students I've worked with, honestly, I'm very sorry here because this collage program only allowed me to put 500 people in here, and I needed a lot more. However, um, I will say that, you know, if I have been able to give flight to my imagination, it is only because of all these wonderful um, students that I have uh, uh, worked with. Um, so there's been the, all the PhD students, and I really wanted to be able to talk more about all of their uh, achievements. But, you know, if I just talked for 10 minutes on each of them, we'll all be here for three hours. Um, you know, uh, Tamas, who's done excellent work in uh, performance queries. Uh, Edmund, who did amazing stuff uh, with uh, uh, betting uh, markets and, and, and the Kelly criterion. Um, and, and, and so on and so forth. And Jack Kelly, who's now at DeepMind, who did amazing work on disaggregating um, whole house electricity uh, consumption feeds and working out what kind of devices were on at what time and so on. Uh, it's, they've all been amazing, and I could go on for, for hours about each of them. Um, also, to all of my project students, yeah? You guys, I, I don't know, I, ca I, I can't supervise enough projects. Uh, but you guys have been absolutely uh, amazing, and I have enjoyed working with every single one of you. Also, to all of my wonderful Imperial colleagues, both past and, uh, and present, yeah, my old PhD supervisor, Pete Harrison, uh, Barbara Claxton, who for many years was right next door and, and, and really helped me with all the uh, admin problems and so on. Uh, everybody who works in the computing support group, all the administrators in the department, all the support staff, uh, all of my colleagues, all the people in the business school, all the people in the data science uh, uh, institute, all the people in the faculty. Honestly, it's an absolute pleasure to work here and work with you guys. Uh, also, to everybody in industry, it's absolutely vital that we keep our links to industry alive so that we have interesting things for our students to work on and interesting uh, topics to uh, research. This is just a small sample of some of the people that I am incredibly grateful to for all of the lovely interaction and so on that they have with our, with our students. Um, also, to... Uh, research colleagues from around the world, and I'm very happy. Uh, Katinka here is going to give the uh, vote of thanks, 
but you know Nigel and Aunt from uh, uh, Newcastle is also here. Cathy uh, is, is, is here as well, and that's uh, uh, very nice. Uh, finally, I just a quick word to say. I'm a firm believer in our entrepreneurship, and I'm really encouraged when I see our students not just wanting a job in financial services or whatever it happens to be, but actually being willing to go out there, take their project work, and launch it out there in the real world as a real uh, startup. And I don't have time. Again, I could talk for half an hour in each of these. Uh, but if you want to have a, a, a look afterwards at some of these uh, startups, these are great. Uh, uh, examples of how our students are using uh, blockchain technology to revolutionize particular um, uh, industries. And that's it. I think you're worried that I'm going to start again. <laughs> Fortunately, this is a dynamically reconfiguring PetriNet, right? And so what will now happen is that uh, we'll have the vote of thanks. Thank you very much. honor to me for me to give this vote of thanks and it is very difficult for me to find something interesting to add to all this list still so I was wondering a little bit about um, what there is left what will hasn't mentioned and of course looking at the list of names there are some things he hasn't mentioned but something I remember is the work on epidemics and I remember very nice talks with included history lectures about the development of epi epidemics and the other topic um, I remember very well are the, um, is, is the, uh, the energy management where um, you gave a talk in, in Edinburgh um, during which um, the, the radio or the heating at Imperial College was switched on and off and that was part of the modeling work somehow and also done together of course with the students. Um, <clears throat> so. Um, about the, I was wondering also during your talk, what you didn't mention is I, I know about the games and the prediction, and um, I was always wondering whether the betting um, really works very well and whether the betting helps you to um, make your salary competitive to your <laughs> students. Um, or, yeah. <laughs> How well that works. Yeah, so it's always great to have the students at conferences, of course. And, and I'm curious to see what will come next with the, the cryptocurrencies. Um, in preparation for, for this, I was thinking a little bit about um, how long we know each other, when, where and when I met uh, Will. And I actually met Jeremy first in 1999, I think, at um, UKPU in Bristol. And, um, and I met Will, I think, at the tool tools conference in 2002, which was uh, organized here at Imperial. And I think Will, uh, Pete was mostly responsible for that. And ever since I've, I've been at Imperial many, many times, um, maybe once a year. So I think it is the place that I've visited most often. Um, <clears throat> uh, and earlier this year, I have spent my um, sabbatical sem uh, semester here. And I'm not the only person that has done this. I think Soraya Sertai from Versailles has done it, and Nigel has been here. So I'm very grateful that this was possible, even though there is a constant space shortage at the department. And so I'm, I'm still very happy that longer term visitors can come. Um, <clears throat> so, and I'm also very glad that, that you've been promoted. Um, and, and the college is recognizing the importance of this work because that gives all of us from this community a partner at Imperial College who we can visit, and that is really good. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, and, um, well, what people value for is not only do you enable and produce excellent research work, you're also a very far-sighted organizer. And you've hosted lots of major conferences, and um, lately, London has become so expensive that some conferences like Value Tools move away. But maybe in times of Brexit, this will get better again. <laughs> um, 
Um, so you, you're continuously hosting meetups and workshops and PC meetings, and people totally rely on you um, because they know you will not con uh, compromise on the participants' experience in any way. Um, you consider the convenience of the location, so the location is always perfect. You will make sure all the technology is there and in place and you know how to operate it, unlike some other people. And um, um, you will arrange for a babysitter, you will walk the dog and you're worried about people's parking problems. <laughs> and so there's help for everything. Um, you, and you, you welcome everyone to your office, which I shared with you during my sabbatical stay. And that didn't stop you from meeting groups of students and colleagues in that same office while I was there, <laughs> too. Um, uh, this office looks very small from outside, but I'm sure it's another platform nine and three quarter. So as you go in, the, a new world unfolds, and, and there's plenty of space. Um, so you also care about the students and keep, as we've heard, strong ties with industry and make sure they all find very well-paid jobs and they're also very well fed on the way there during the, the industry um, lectures and, and at other times. So it's, it's a, a delight to work with you, in fact, and the, the best is that you've always, uh, you always have a positive take on everything and enjoy whatever there is to enjoy, even, well, it might be the, the coffee on the fifth floor or the view from your office window. Um, meanwhile, you pity those you see for their view. Um, of Huxley building. Um, <clears throat> so working with you is a lot of fun um, in, in, in the good times, of course, but also in, in tough times, the academic tough times where your genetic cheerfulness is really great. Um, so um, I think we all, the, the, we all, the research community and, and your colleagues, thank you, dep the department, for making sure you continue to be here. And thank you for the work and for being a great colleague and a good friend. Those of you who have a ticket for the reception to move to 170 Queensgate for some drinks, and those of you who don't know how to get there, just ask one of the locals. Thank you all very much for coming. <laughs>